Well, praise the Lord, folks. It is Wednesday night, and that means it's time for Bible study, our midweek Bible study. We begin at about 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. And we invite you to join with us in our home. It's a little more casual, uh, but we invite you to join with us in our home for a time of Bible study and teaching. Um, it's very important for the people of God that uh, they have a balanced diet. And by a balanced diet, I mean that uh, they be able to have preaching, but also that they be able to have teaching. Uh, teaching and preaching serve different types of purposes. They operate in slightly different ways. And uh, teaching is very important. I remember years ago, Brother Gillum, my mentor in the faith that I talk about quite a bit, uh, Brother Gillum told me, you know, he said, there are some things that really don't belong in the pulpit. They don't belong uh, being preached at people. You know, you preach things uh, to inspire, you preach things to encourage, and you do often preach things to instruct as well. Um, but there are there are some subject matters within the faith that really, to be effective, they have to be carefully, prayerfully taught. And the people of God have to receive good, solid instruction from the Word of God. And thankfully, according to a couple of overseers I've had over the years, um, they said, well, Brother Charles... The Lord has gifted you and allowed you to be able to not only preach, but also to teach. And I hope that's true, because uh, I have known a lot of preachers in my lifetime who could preach a blue streak, but they couldn't teach worth a hang. They really couldn't. Um, when it come down to actually really digging into the Word of God and really presenting it in a way that the people of God could really wrap their mind around it. They just weren't able to do that. And then I've known preachers, and there, there are pastors and uh, on television even, and different ones, and all they can do is teach. And uh, they really are not, they don't ever preach. All they ever do is teach. And you might say, well, but that's okay. No, it is not. Preaching and teaching serve very different functions, and they are they are very important to the health and well-being of God's people. That's why the Apostle Paul told Timothy, he said, preach, teach, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. So you see, there's, there's different purposes and different levels. Preaching is one thing, teaching is another, and honestly, Exhorting is yet another. Uh, exhorting kind of leans in the direction of encouragement and inspiration uh, alone. That, that is uh, the exclusive purpose of exhortation. And there are times when the Lord will give me a word of exhortation. And meaning, uh, it's really not a sermon. It's not real complex. It doesn't offer a lot of uh, details and, you know, a lot of stuff. But rather, it is just a, a basic message uh, from a basic text that helps to provide a word of encouragement and inspiration for the people of God. And that's a word of exhortation. All right. We want to move right into our Bible study this week. I don't want to waste any time. I hope folks will join us um, as they're able. And if they're not able to see the Bible study, the teaching from the beginning, then hopefully they'll uh, watch the video later. Now, tonight, so that you good folks know what we're doing, 
we are using once again our broadcast software so we are um, we are broadcasting to uh, two different channels on Facebook we're broadcasting through LinkedIn we're broadcasting through Twitter and we are broadcasting through uh, YouTube as well so this evening if all goes well um, no matter what platform you may be on uh, you might be watching us on any one of those platforms and uh, it excites me to know. It looks like we're doing good here. Don't mind me a second. I'm going to check the volume. I just want to make sure where our sound is there. Let me see. Okay. Is everybody able to hear me? I'm not hearing anything on YouTube here. No, I'm not hearing anything. I'm not hearing anything either. Why is that? <coughs> Let me see what's going on here real quick. This mic, this particular mic doesn't have a uh, it's not. Now I'm hearing something. Are you hearing? Are you hearing? I'm hearing it from your laptop. Oh, man. Are you hearing? Yeah, I'm testing one. Yeah, there it is. All right. Okay, folks, if you're watching, because we're using our broadcast software for the first time, I really need you to let us know if there are any problems, if there are any issues. Uh, so please, if you have any trouble with sound or anything, let us know, okay? Um, this is at the house, so we have set up a whole different rig, a whole different uh, computer, a whole different camera, everything here at the house. So, um, the one at the church, for those of you who tried watching Sunday and we had trouble Sunday with our broadcast, we do have the sound issue resolved. Um, so hopefully this coming Sunday we'll not have issues like we did last Sunday. I, you know, really, I'm telling you, it's very confusing to me because we don't really mess with settings and what have you. And so therefore, things ought to work as they've always worked. But for some reason, and it might have been our uh, broadcast software, there, it might have needed an update or something that we weren't aware of. But for some reason, um, our YouTube and Facebook, neither one of them had uh, good sound. We were having terrible sound trouble, and so I apologize for that. Um, we. I uh, believe we've got that fixed, okay? So for next week, uh, we should be good. You don't have booby a pair of earphones or anything, so you can keep one in and make sure things sound good. Huh? Um, I have some, but I'm trying to remember where they're at. Uh, anyway, maybe you can at least keep it on low volume and just kind of give it a listen every once in a while to make sure everything's okay. I really need folks to uh, let us know if there are any issues. The only problem is I'm not seeing at the moment where I would uh, have access to their comments. 
It depends on whether they're watching on YouTube or Facebook, okay? Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, hopefully we're doing okay. We're also videotaping this Bible study. I'm doing it with an entirely separate camera. And that is to make absolutely certain we get it on video. And so, uh, you know what? Oh my goodness. goodness. I don't think that camera has the mic on it. Mm -hmm. Dear Lord, have mercy. Uh, I've been here all by myself today trying to get all this stuff squared away. And uh, that camera. That's the broadcast mic. Uh, that is not the recording camera. Oh. The recording camera needs to have a mic on it as well. And, uh, oh well. Um, I don't know where to get another mic. No. It's all right. Uh, unplug the mic from this camera because I don't think that's the mic that's doing our sound. This one? Not that one, the one underneath it. There you go. That one? Yeah, and plug it into the camera over there on the left. Should be a little round hole on the bottom there. Oh, it's on the left, um, on the other side, toward the front. You gotta pull that little flat back. Just pop it in the round hole. Where it says mic, okay. Where it says mic, yeah. Honey, you can put it on the You have to be very careful. That'll ensure, I hope, that the sound is working on uh, both the video that we're taking separately from the broadcast that we're doing through our broadcast software. Real quickly, just double check again and make sure we have sound on. There you go. Okay, good. All right, so we want to move into our Bible study tonight. Uh, Sister Amy in... Uh, Kansas has requested special prayer. I've been praying for them uh, today, and I would ask everyone in the church to help us pray for she and Clint. They've got um, something that they're going through, and they need the Lord's help, so we need to pray for them, and um, uh, we want to do that today as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our Bible study this evening. Master, we love you, God, and we thank you, Lord, for every single opportunity that we have as the people of God. What a blessing it is to live in a free society. So many around the world do not have the liberties and the freedoms that we enjoy to come together, Lord, as people of God and to explore the Word of God. Master, in the name of Jesus, we ask God that you would loose tonight the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Help the teacher to teach and the student to hear and receive. Master, in the name of Jesus, open our minds, make our hearts ready, cultivate, break up stony ground, and make it ready, O oh God, to receive the seed which is the word of God. And Master, tonight, we have special prayer requests, and we lift up today uh, Sister Amy and Clint. We ask God that you would intervene in this matter. Lord, you and you alone are able to do what needs to be done. And we know and we trust God that not only are you able, but also that you're willing. In the name of Jesus, we come against every demon spirit from hell that would try to bring chaos and destruction. Master, in the name of Jesus, Satan, you're a liar and the father of lies. We claim victory and liberty over you in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And Master, tonight as well, we lift up uh, our brother today, 
who sent in a prayer request, Brother Dan and his partner. Lord, they are going through health issues. They're going through a number of things that are causing them great distress. And we know, God, you're a miracle-working God. And in the name of the Lord, we ask, God, that you would reach down at this very hour Touch them in body, touch them in mind. Lord, today, encourage their faith and help them to grab hold of the horns of the altar that they might receive the blessing and the miracle that they so desperately need at this hour. Master, as the word of God is taught tonight, let healing flow as the people of God listen and hear the word of truth. Let them receive the blessing, the miracle that they might so desperately need. For, Lord, the word of God is the channel whereby so many great things come into our lives. Not only is our faith encouraged, inspired, and caused to grow, but, Lord, oftentimes as the word of God comes across our hearing, we become the recipients of those things which we so desperately need. Move tonight, O oh God, by your spirit. Touch every heart, every mind. And we ask it all today in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I have been out today trying to get a bunch of different things done. And to be honest with you, I am tired. So I really need the Lord to touch me in a big way to help me uh, with this study tonight. We've been talking about the gifts of the Spirit. We started out in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the first 11 verses. And again, I want to make clear, this study, I, I don't teach Honestly, I don't know how else to say it. I don't teach anything at a shallow level. I don't believe in kind of scraping the surface of stuff. Uh, if I'm going to teach on something, I'm going to teach on it, and we're going to understand it right down to the smallest screw and the smallest nut and bolt. So I want you to understand tonight, we are starting at 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11. There are dozens of scriptures that we're going to be looking at through the course of this study, all of which deal with the, fruit, uh, the gifts of the Spirit, various aspects of the fruits, um, various principles related to the, excuse me, I keep saying fruits, to the gifts of the Spirit. And we're going to be looking at all of those. And there will be some gifts that the scriptures offer a much greater um, in-depth understanding of. And so we are going to be going deeper into our examination, for instance, of things like uh, speaking with other tongues. We're going to be looking at that later in the study with greater depth. And then also we'll be looking with greater depth at prophecy, for instance, uh, primarily those two, because those two, uh, there's a lot of additional peripheral um, teaching available to us um, concerning those particular gifts. So we'll be looking at those gifts with a lot more um, uh, in depth in the future, okay? Now, the first week, we began to talk about the concept of a word of wisdom and what a word of wisdom is. The second week, last week, we were looking at a word of knowledge. This week, where I believe we'll be able to do two this week, um, because they're very uh, similar in a sense, and they kind of work together. So this week we're going to look at both um, the gifts of healings, or I should say the gifts of healing, and the working, uh, excuse me, no, the, the, 
the gift of faith and the gifts of healing. Those are the two that we're going to try to look at today. So we want to talk about this. Every gift, of course, is, is important. Every gift, as we saw earlier in the first few verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, every gift has its own function, has its own purpose, operates in its own unique way. Uh, not everyone, or anyone for that matter, in the church is going to operate in all the gifts. If you operated in all the gifts, you'd run around thinking you're Jesus, and that would be a very dangerous Seriously, that would be a very dangerous place for somebody to be. If one person operated in all the gifts, we're going to look at this more in depth in the future, but you need to understand the gifts are parted out within the body of Christ for a reason. One reason why it is so imperative that people get this idiotic notion out of their head. I don't need the church. I don't need to go to church. I can worship God at home. Honey, there's a lot of stuff you can do at home that you don't need to go somewhere to do, but that does not mean that you are going to benefit fully as you ought sitting at home worshiping the Lord alone as you would benefit if you're part of a good Holy Ghost filled fire baptized church that is operating in the gifts of the Spirit. One of the reasons over the course of these many years that I've been involved in uh, affirming ministry, one of the reasons why I have longed for our church to grow and for our church to uh, begin to experience, you know, a population growth is because I fully understand the principle of body ministry. I fully understand that for the gifts of the Spirit to operate as they ought, You've got to have more than two or three or five or ten people. And first of all, the gifts are parted out based upon one's ability to receive. The Word of God said that the Lord gives uh, gifts and he blesses and he gives us uh, things based upon our ability to receive. So not everybody that's in the church is even in a place to operate in a gift of the Spirit. There are many uh, new believers. There are many people that come in. There are many people, quite frankly, who aren't very spiritual. There are many people who come in who are on the carnal side or on the worldly side, and they just haven't really invested themselves as fully as they ought to their relationship with God, and they're not in a position for the gifts of the Spirit to be imparted unto them, whatever gift. Uh, the Lord gives gifts, listen carefully now, based upon our ability to receive, and there has to be some framework within us that makes having that gift workable within us. And what I mean by that is, if you're a gossip, you're not somebody the Lord is likely to give a word of knowledge to, to go speak to somebody. You know why? Because as soon as you go speak it to them, you're going to turn around and go speak it to a hundred other people. No. God's not going to trust a gossip with a word of knowledge, okay? And uh, uh, if you're somebody who's constantly making bad decisions and going in wrong directions and doing dumb things, then guess what? It's not very likely that the Lord is going to use you to impart a word of wisdom to, to another believer either, okay? So the Lord is going to use people who have 
um, uh, who have uh, the framework. I can't think of the words I'm trying to use. Yeah, you know, that have characteristics that lend themselves to the various gifts, okay? God is not foolish. He is, he is wise. He uses wisdom in every single impartation. And uh, therefore, uh, the gifts are imparted based upon an individual's ability and uh, kind of their wiring, you know, whether or not they're wired to be able to operate in that gift and to do it well. Uh, unlike Mr. Trump, God doesn't say, oh, I'm going to have all the best people, all the best people. And then five minutes later, he's griping and complaining that uh, he gave gifts to people and they screwed everything up and they were lousy and they didn't know how to operate within it. Um, God is not foolish. He doesn't operate like that. So uh, this is one reason why, you know, the gifts are not just handed out willy-nilly, but rather the Lord is very careful. The Word of God tells us that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, meaning God never, ever turns from his decision to impart a calling or to impart a gift into someone's life. So therefore, he is very careful to make certain that the individual whom he is entrusting with whatever gift, uh, that they are in a place in their life to be able to operate within that gift for the remainder of their days, okay? And uh, today we're looking at, first of all, the gift of faith. Faith is something the Word of God tells us is a gift of God even from our very, the very onset of our relationship with the Lord. Even when we first begin our relationship with the Lord, the Word of God said, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So even the faith that is necessary to believe God for salvation, God imparts to us. And you might say, well, how, how come? Why? How does that work? Well, it's very easy because as unbelievers, as sinners, we are dominated by the spirit of unbelief. We are dominated by satanic powers. We are dominated by the spirits uh, of the this world and therefore God when he sees us embracing the gospel at least at a cognitive level or even an emotional level he then gifts us with faith so that we can fully embrace it and grab hold of it and hold on to it because faith is the currency uh, by which all things are done. Everything related to God is done through faith. Faith is so important. Um, this is why, you know, a, a believer or a preacher can't just walk into a nursing home and run around healing everybody, you know. I've heard people say such stupid things sometimes. You know, they say, well, why don't Christians just walk into a hospital and heal everybody if they're supposed to be able to? It's very simple because the currency that is used in heaven, the currency that as citizens of heaven, like I preached the other day, uh, the currency that believers use in order to attain anything from the Lord is faith. We don't use money, we don't use uh, uh, flattery, we don't use compliments. No, if you're going to get anything from the Lord, you've got to operate from a place of faith. A lot of people, when they're struggling with an issue in their life or they're struggling with something, what they don't understand is there are ways that you can encourage your faith. And you can find the faith to believe God to receive whatever. If you need deliverance, you can find the faith. You can actually 
build your faith up to receive your deliverance. You can build your faith up to receive a, a healing. Many people have been sick in body. The doctors have given them up and said there was no hope for them. And what they began to do, they began either, they began to listen to preachers who uh, preach uh, specifically on the issue of healing and what have you, or they begin to really study the Bible and they begin to look at the issue of healing and, and all this. And what happens is as they invest themselves in this matter, their faith is built up and their faith is encouraged. I've told this story um, this kind of goes to, that's why I said faith and healing are, are really very, they're different gifts, but they're, they're also kind of tied together in a very real way. Um, I've told the story about years ago, I was pastoring uh, my first affirming ministry in New York City, and I was called upon by a friend of mine to go to a hospital where a young lady, she was, if I remember correctly, she was 29. I think she was 29 at the time. And uh, she was a heterosexual girl, beautiful young black girl. She had contracted HIV through a relationship she had. And she now was in the hospital dying. The doctors, she had never gone in for any form of, she didn't, you know, she was humiliated and embarrassed. So she never pursued any kind of treatment, which of course was dangerous. Her immune system was depleted beyond recognition, destroyed. And now some form of opportunistic infection had come into her body and the doctors could not identify it. They were trying and trying and trying. They could not figure out what was wrong with her. Well, she lost all kinds of weight. Um, she was so ill, they had to feed her intravenously. They told her family, like myself many years ago, that she'd be dead within 24 hours. My friend, who had no interest, and he told me so, in our church, no interest in my Jesus. This was a young gay man in New York City that I had known for many years. He and I had been friends for a long time. And he told me when I came back to the Lord and I was starting my affirming ministry, he told me, he said, Charles, I love you and we'll always be friends, but honestly, I'll probably never be interested in your church. And blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, that's fine. Listen, I can love you. I can befriend you. I can uh, have a relationship with you as friends and what have you. Uh, you, even if you're an agnostic or an atheist, but if you're going to be argumentative, you know, and want to debate all the time, that's different because I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be argumentative. I'm not going to debate. But as long as we respect one another, I have no problem being friends with people who believe differently or think differently than I do. Well, lo and behold, this same guy who told me he'd never be interested in me or my, uh, my church or my God, uh, lo and behold, one Sunday before our, our service at the LGBT Community Center in Manhattan on 13th Street, this fellow whose name was Fabian called me on the phone. Uh, or actually, he paged me because back then I didn't have a cell phone. I had a pager. And so I called him, and he said, Charles, I have a friend. She's in the hospital here. They, they've given her less than 24 hours to live. And he was telling me her story. And so I said, okay, Fabian. I said, well, we can pray for her. And he said, well, actually, I was kind of hoping maybe you could do something else. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, he said, would you come pray for her? Because I know you, you believe that God heals people and all. And I said, yeah, I'd be happy to. I said, the only problem is he mentioned that she had, uh, was it, I, now I'm starting to forget because I'm old and tired. Either eight or ten members of her family were there at the hospital with her, and they were all from Texas. And uh, Mesquite, Texas, as a matter of fact. And... Uh, 
I said, Fabian, before I come, you need to ask the family if it's okay if I come to pray for her. I said, I can't just walk in a room and pray for somebody, you know, and I don't want to get there and then have them be opposed to it, you know. And I said, so do me a favor, just uh, talk to them, call my pager, leave a message, and uh, when we're done with church this morning, I'll come up there if I have a message saying to go ahead and come. Well, the service, we had a great service. Um, I had a message on my pager. I listened to it. It was Fabian. He said, I spoke to her mom and her dad and her family, and they said, by all means, come. So uh, I got on a subway. I went up to uh, the hospital uh, in Midtown Manhattan and walked into the room, and there was this beautiful young lady, absolute skin and bones. I mean, she looked horrifying. She looked horrible. Um, she was so skinny that she literally just like skin pulled over bones. If anybody looked like they were at death's door, she did. Um, she was already manifesting. For those of you that know anything about end-of-life care, <clears throat> she was already manifesting what they often refer to as the death rattle. She was constantly sleeping. It was extremely di difficult for her to be at all alert and at all. This is what happens as you get right to the edge of death. Uh, people who are very sick, they become extremely uh, difficult to remain alert, and they begin to manifest this, what they refer to as the death rattle, you know. Of course, their breathing gets shallow, so on and so forth. That's where she was at. And uh, I walked in the room, and I told the family, I said, I'm a Pentecostal preacher, and I know Fabian. And he asked me if I'd come, and he said, y'all were agreeable to this. And the mother said, oh, praise the Lord. She said, I'm Pentecostal too. And that gave me a little hope. I said, well, hallelujah, at least we have uh, somebody here who understands these things the way that I understand these things. Now, a lot of you might think that immediately the first thing I'm going to do, this girl's at death's door. The first thing I'm going to do, boy, is rush over to her, anoint her with all, lay hands on her and pray for her. No, no, I'm not. Why? Because God operates through the currency of faith. So what I began to do was I began to talk to the family members and I began to exhort them. This is where the concept of exhortation comes in. I began to exhort them. I began to talk to them about the concept of God being a healer and how that in the Old Testament God was a healer. How God spoke through the prophet to the people of Israel and said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. And how that even when the people were plagued by serpents and they were being uh, bit by serpents and dying that the Lord provided a means whereby they could look to uh, the, the serpent on a pole that Moses created and live and receive a miracle. Then I talked about how uh, in the New Testament Gospels, how Jesus healed. And then I talked about how Jesus sent his disciples. And he said, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. He didn't just tell them to go preach. He said, oh, no, no, no. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. Cast out devils freely you have received, freely give. Then I went into the New Testament church after the Lord is saying, I'm going to get shouting happy any minute now. Folks, I believe this stuff. This is real. And I begin to talk to them about how the New Testament believers were performing miracles and how they were healed. Uh, people were being healed through their ministry, and uh, Stephen and Philip and Paul, and you know, and I and I said, and I'm here to tell you, according to the word of the Lord, all New Testament believers, every believer that uh, is born again till Jesus comes, has access to the healing power of God.
And boy, I'm going to tell you, after exhorting them for, I'd say, probably 30 minutes or better, you could feel the faith in the room, literally. You could feel the faith. See, that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to help inspire and encourage their faith. Uh, we needed to believe God for a miracle. We had a big thing to believe the Lord for. This girl's at death's door. I said, now I'm going to anoint Teresa with oil, and I'm going to lay hands on her, and we're going to pray for her. And I said, and by faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, she's going to be well. She's going to be okay. Well, she honestly pretty much slept through the whole thing. And then uh, I anointed her with all, laid hands on her and prayed for her. And when I was done, I excused myself. I said, I'll be back to check on her. Uh, in a day or so, I said, so uh, in the meantime, you all uh, enjoy her company and spend time with her. I said, but I'll be back. I said, but I believe with all my heart she's going to be okay. Well, I left the hospital that day. Monday came, and I thought, well, should I go back to the hospital today? And I, I, something inside me said, no, she's going to be fine, so there's no need for you to rush to the hospital. Go tomorrow. Now, mind you, of course, this girl was supposed to be dead within 24 hours, and, and all the signs indicated that would be the case. This is where faith comes in, folks. And I knew in my spirit, I said, no, she's going to be fine. I'm not going to worry about her. I'll see her tomorrow. Tuesday came, and I went to the hospital, and I walked in the hospital room, and this young lady, God is my eternal witness, was sitting up in her hospital bed. They had the bed propped up. She was sitting up. She was 100% alert and awake not the least bit groggy or sleepy. Her mother grabbed her hand and started flopping it around like a fish and said, look, preacher, look, her color's back, her color's back. She was gray when I saw her. Now her coloring had come back. She said she woke up yesterday. Woo, glory. She said she woke up yesterday morning, and all she said was, Mama, I'm hungry. And her mother said, we started bringing her in food, and she was so hungry. She said, we brought her in pizza. We brought her in fruit. We, bought, we brought her in hospital food. Um, we brought her in McDonald's. Said, my God, we were just dragging food in here from every kind of place. And she said, and this girl ate every single thing we brought in. She said, the doctor came in yesterday and said, I have no clue what is going on. I have no idea what's changed because we have not been treating her for anything. All we've been doing is trying to provide her with uh, survival necessities, food, you know. But whatever it was that was killing her was just ravaging her because we didn't know how to treat it. Said, And, you know, you can't just throw antibiotics and whatever at stuff, not having a clue. You know, uh, they couldn't tell what on earth her problem was. And this girl began to recover. And her mother said, the doctor came in this morning, and he said, my God, if she continues to recover like this, he says she can go home Friday. Well, folks, Friday she went home. And I called her mom a while later, about oh, a couple weeks later, down in Texas. Her, she had given me her number. I called her mom. I said, how's Teresa doing and everything? She said, oh, preacher, you wouldn't believe. She said, she's doing wonderful. She said, she came back to Texas with us. She decided to leave New York, come back to Texas with us. She said, I'll have her write you. I'll have her send you a note. And so uh, a few days later, I got a little note from Teresa, and Teresa said, uh, Pastor, you won't believe it. She said, listen to this. She said, they cannot find the virus in my body. <laughs> said, they can't even find it. She said, 
I'm going back to school. I've got a job. She said, I feel great. This was a girl who not even a month before was lying, dying on a deathbed. And the doctors had given her, her up for dead. Pastor, why are you sharing all this? I'm sharing all this to help you understand. The biggest mistake that a lot of believers make when they're asked, you know, to pray for the sick or they're asked to uh, minister to someone who is in a desperate situation. The biggest mistake a lot of people make is they think they have some magic power at their disposal and they can just, you know, impart it at will. And they forget the all-important principle. Faith is the currency through which everything in heaven is dispersed. Okay, that's why the word of God said, for without faith, it is impossible to please him. It is impossible to please God in the absence of faith. Now, as a gift, faith, as a gift, the word of the Lord said, we're all given a measure of faith when it comes to salvation and believing the gospel and being able to start our journey with the Lord. And our faith then will develop and grow and grow as we walk with the Lord. Okay, we're all given a measure of faith. But the gift of faith is something very different. And the booby, can you do me a favor? Fix the angle of that camera. People are going to think I'm in an earthquake zone. It's just sitting on top of that ledge. So just try to, yeah, try it. There you go. I, I don't, I, I can't see anything about sound. Uh, we're going to have to work on this. This, for some reason, the software is not showing like it does at the church and I can't figure out how to make it show like it does at the church so I don't see anything related to sound at all which is part of the problem I had earlier all right it's imperative to understand that faith is the currency through which everything that comes from the Lord uh, is able to be imparted to us okay and that is something we must remember when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit. That is something that we must uh, remember when it comes to uh, operating in the gifts of the Spirit. Faith is still an integral uh, part of the equation. Now, the gift of faith. This is, a, this is an interesting gift. The gift of faith is not just... The ability to believe God for great big things. That's how a lot of times I've heard it taught, you know. Oh, a person with the gift of faith can believe God to move mountains. Hallelujah, glory to God. Well, I mean, in a sense, that's right. Uh, the gift of faith is a, an, a divinely imparted, uh, almost endless well of faith. And there are believers that God endows with just the most incredible faith in the world and boy I mean to tell you if you want somebody to pray for you you want to go to that person that you know has the gift of faith how do you know they have the gift of faith well usually it's in their track record okay you see that uh, they just are incredibly effective in their prayer life they're incredibly effective in uh, seeing miracles come their way and uh, that is one way to know that someone has been endowed by God with the gift of faith but you know I was talking to the Lord about this earlier today and he told me he said you know there there's another way the gift of faith operates he said that a lot of people don't realize and they don't think about and I said okay and that would be how and he said, well, for instance, when a preacher or a missionary has to go into a really difficult situation, and there are many missionaries who have gone uh, into lands and to 
communities and to tribes and places where diseases are rampant, where cannibalism is present, where violence is often visited upon strangers. These people have to have an incredible amount of faith in order to walk into a fire like that. And the Lord said, when I call people a lot of times to certain uh, tasks and I give people certain callings, he said, I also often will endow that person with the gift of faith. And they don't even realize it. And as he was telling me this today, I realized, I said, Lord, I think I know why you're telling me this. Because I've been doing something for 30 years that I never dreamed in a million years I would do it for more than three or four years without getting so discouraged and so despondent that I would just quit. But I've been doing something for 30 years, and, and I, I chalked it up to just perseverance, you know, to just hanging in there. And the Lord said, no, it's not perseverance. It's not hanging in there. It's faith. Because I've put it in your heart. I've put it in you. That no matter, oh hallelujah, no matter what you see, no matter what happens, no matter how things go, you are constantly believing. You're constantly trusting. You're constantly believing that the goal and the vision that you've set in your heart, you are going to one day arrive at. Said so that's the gift of faith. And there are missionaries that God's endowed. There are pastors that God's given the gift of faith to. Why? Because he knew that they were going into a very difficult field of labor. He knew they were going into a very difficult situation. And that if they were going to be able to survive, if they were going to be able to persevere in that particular circumstance, they would have to have divinely imparted faith same thing is true folks for a lot of people when it comes to uh, marital trouble it, same thing is true for people when it comes to family trouble or they you have a child who's a drug addict or an alcoholic a lot of times uh, we can quit we can give up we can just get so tired and so worn out and Yet, at the same time, God can endow us with faith so that no matter how long it takes, no matter how many years pass, no matter how much struggle we go through, we are able to keep believing the Lord and keep believing the Lord and keep believing the Lord. That is because God has given us the gift of faith. Hallelujah. I know a lady, when I was pastoring my uh, second church, my, it was Church of God, uh, Cleveland, Tennessee. I was pastoring my second church over by Fort Worth many, many years ago. And I had a lady, she was actually related to the girl I married. And uh, she had a son that lived with her, and he had a drinking problem. And he just, he had a lot of issues, you know, and... and uh, she went through an awful lot with him, and we were constantly praying with her, and she constantly would ask for prayer for him. And don't you know, uh, oh, it's been a pretty good while now. We went to Riverside Church in Fort Worth and visited. Man, it's been several years ago now. And don't you know she was there? And I talked to her, you know, and she, uh, I asked her, I said, so how's your son? And she said, he's the same. He's still, she said, but I keep praying and I keep believing God. See, God had to give that mother faith to be able to believe. He'll be all right. You watch. He may be delivered. He may be saved on his deathbed, but he'll be all right. 
I've talked about Sister Chambers, a little Pentecostal lady from East Texas that I used to be friends with. She's kind of like an adopted grandma to me. I love that lady. That little lady was the epitome of what a Holy Ghost-filled believer is supposed to be. That woman was absolutely the absolute epitome of what a spirit-filled person is supposed to look like. My God, talk about faith, talk about believing God, talk about hearing from the Lord and operating in a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom and dear God, that little lady, I'm telling you, if you heard some of the testimonies that she would share with me over the years, they'd blow your mind. Just some of the things uh, she and her husband, her husband was unsaved, not a Christian, hated God, hated everything to do with God. She came to the Lord, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the whole nine yards. He moved her to a community, a rural community in, I want to say, um, Missouri, if I remember correctly. And there was no Pentecostal church, and this is way back at the beginning of, pretty much the beginning of the Pentecostal movement, and uh, early in the Pentecostal movement. So there weren't a lot of Pentecostal churches anyway, you know. But they were out in the boonies, and they had no Pentecostal church. And uh, she said uh, there were no churches that welcomed her because she was a tongue-talking, shouting, running the aisles kind of Pentecostal gal. And, uh, and she was literally a young woman at that point. She probably wasn't even 30, you know. And um, she said, so... I went to the local schoolhouse and talked to them. Could we use the schoolhouse on Sunday? She said, I wanted my kids to have a Sunday school. She said, I wasn't called to preach. God never called me to preach. said, I wasn't stupid enough to get up there and think I was going to preach and pastor a church or anything. She said, but I could at least establish a Sunday school, and we can invite children to come and give them Bible education you know and she said uh, they made arrangements they were able to use this way back in the day said they were able to use the the schoolhouse and she said uh, what they would do is she said we would all come together in one room and we would sing some songs and kind of pray she said and the spirit would move she said holy mackerel she said the holy ghost would move she said sometimes we get to shout she said it was like having church it was a worship service is what it was she said but i didn't preach after the worship service we'd break up and we'd have classes for the kids and she said over the course of couple of years their little Sunday school started out with her kids and it grew and grew she said before too long we literally had kids from that rural community she said we had a hundred kids coming for Sunday school on Sunday and she said and boy we'd have these Holy Ghost blowouts before Sunday school she said my God the Spirit of the Lord would move and we'd shout and dance and have such a wonderful time she said then I realized that we really need a church if we got a Sunday school, but we need a church, she said. But I knew, this is, this is what I mean about people knowing their role, not trying to do something they're not called to do. She said, God didn't call me to preach, so I, I had no business trying to preach. She said, but what I did is I put out feelers, I began to talk to people, uh, tried writing some other church congregations, Pentecostals around, see if there was a preacher available that could come. And she said, we were able to get some that could come in, uh, kind of an itinerant, you know, and they preach, she said. So I was able to schedule like different ones on different Sundays and what have you. She said, but I was looking and trying to find one who could be there regular. She said, finally, I heard about this one preacher, she said, but he was Methodist. But he was available to come every Sunday and preach for us. So the first Sunday he came, and uh, she said, we did our worship service at the start of the, 
Sunday school and all. She said, man, the spirit moved. We shouted. We danced. We had church. She said, then we broke off into Sunday school. Then we come together, and he preached. She said, and he got up there, and he had the gall to tell the people that this was foolishness this was garbage god wasn't in this foolishness you don't act like that you don't do like that above and above and above and above and above sister chambers said uh, after the service i told him i said you know why don't you come over to my house for dinner let's have you over for dinner so he'd go over to her house for dinner she said i had a wood burning stove this is what I told you it's way back in the day, like back in the in the 30s or 40s, you know. And she said, I had a wood burning stove there. And this guy was telling me how that all that carrying on and shouting and making noise and all that was foolishness. And God wasn't in that and blah, blah, blah. And she said, I opened the front door of my wood stove and I looked at him and I said, you know, give me your hand. And he looked at it and he said, what are you talking about? Why? She said, give me your hand. He said, why? Woman, what do you, what do you, what do you want to do with my hand? She said, I'm going to put it in that fire. I'm going to put it in that stove. And he looked at her and said, you're crazy. She said, oh, I'm not crazy. She said, I want to put, my, I want to put your hand in that fire and see if you don't react to it. She said, don't tell me this ain't real. Don't tell me this isn't God, don't tell me. She said, let me tell you something. When the Holy Ghost from heaven comes down like he did on the day of Pentecost, the word of God said that the people at Jerusalem thought, the, thought that the believers were drunk. Well, talking in tongues couldn't have made them think they were drunk. They were hearing their, the gospel being preached in their own languages. So why would you think that hearing people preaching in you know a multitude of different languages implied drunkenness obviously that that wouldn't make me think people were drunk there must have been something else going on that made them think these people were drunk so she began to go down with him and she began to basically expound about the move of God that was happening in the world and how God was filling people with the Holy Ghost like he did on the day of Pentecost and that they were speaking with other tongues. And she said, and boy, she said, when the Spirit of the Lord comes down, she said, people react to it. They respond to it. She said, man, when the, when the Spirit of God touches a human body, she said, when the Spirit of the Lord it just touches your soul, she said, something happens and you just express it said there's joy there's shouting there's dancing she said look at the look at the book of psalms look at what david wrote how to worship he talked about exuberant worship he talked about loud worship he talked about vibrant worship he talked about dancing he talked about timbrels and trumpets he you know and she went and told all this to this preacher and he left and said, well, you know, I'm not so sure about this, blah, blah, blah. Well, he goes on. Next Sunday he comes. He grabs hold of Sister Chambers. And he, said, he gives her the biggest hug. Tears streaming down his face. He said, I got the Holy Ghost. I received the Holy Ghost. He said, I was home, and I was talking to the Lord about all this. And I said, Lord, I don't understand it, but if it's real, and if it's you, then I want it. And he said, before I knew what hit me, he said, I could feel the presence of God come down in that room. And I was speaking in some other language as the Spirit of God gave me the utterance. He said, long story short, there is to this day a Pentecostal church that Sister Chambers started in that town of Missouri. You see, God gives us the faith we need. When the Lord calls people to a unique and challenging task, if that task is beyond us, if it's beyond our ability to do because we lack patience because our our self-esteem that's that's where i struggle 
I grew up, I've talked about this, and I'm very open about it because I hope people, I hope people benefit from my talking about this because I think there's a lot of people who are like me and have experienced similar. I grew up with a unsaved, unchristian father who was the most narcissistic demon that ever walked the face of the earth. When God called me to preach at eight years old, my father, it was almost like Satan entered his heart, literally. And at eight years old, my father began to come against me and my faith constantly. I grew up constantly being told that that religion was bunk and all that Jesus stuff was crap and blah, 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 blah. My father constantly came against my faith every day day folks and here I am telling people that God called me to preach and my father is just you know beating me down he was so verbally abusive and psychologically abusive uh, of not just myself but also my mother and my brothers you know uh, he made Donald Trump look like an angel literally and and so you people understand why I feel the way about Trump I do I know exactly what a narcissist looks like and I know exactly how damaging and destructive and demonic they are and I'm telling you folks that man should never come within a thousand miles of Washington DC I've lived with that I grew up with that garbage so I was constantly being bombarded. My father never said a positive word. I, I can't even say to me. My father never said a positive word to any of his three sons in our lifetime to this day. I watch sometimes these TV shows uh, you know, talent TV shows where uh, America's got talent or whatever. I watch it sometimes on uh, YouTube and stuff. And there's there's something that touches me when I see parents or I see siblings, you know, uh, sitting there with tears in their eyes, watching their brother, their sister, their son, their daughter perform. I was watching today, and one young man. Uh, was getting up to perform and they asked him who was with him and he said my mother and my my sister or whoever and Simon said well who's your biggest fan who's your biggest supporter he said actually it's my father and he said your father he said you just said you know your sister's here your mother's here he said but you're saying it's your father who's your biggest fan all of a sudden, you hear a voice come out of the audience. I am. And it was the father. The boy didn't know his dad was there. He said, I thought my dad had to work. I didn't think he was going to be able to be here. But that was a father who wanted to support his son. And those kind of things bring me to tears every time because I've never experienced anything within a thousand miles of that in my entire life. I have never one day of my life had my father act like he gave a care about anything I did, or my brothers for that matter. If he had anything to say, it was destructive, it was negative, it was condemnatory, it was critical. <sighs> well, I'm going to tell you, you grew up with that foolishness. And no matter how hard you try, I've told Tommy this a million times, you become hardwired. You, you become, it changes your psychological wiring. And I don't respond well, and I confess and I admit, I don't respond well to criticism. I don't. I really don't. I have an extremely hard time with it. It's not because I'm full of myself. It's not because I'm proud. It's not because I think I'm great. That's not even close. And Tommy can tell you he knows good and bloody well that I, that's not the reasoning. But I just, my whole life, I grew up with that constantly being thrown at me every minute of every day destruction, 
destruction, destruction, destruction. And criticism is hard for me to swallow. I try, I try hard to, to do, and I do a whole lot better now than I did when I was a teenager, I'll tell you that right now. Um, and you say, well, Pastor, why are you sharing all this? And I'm making a point, believe it or not, I know where I'm going with this. I absolutely abhor failure. I abhor failure. If, if I... If I try to do something and I just can't do it, and it's for whatever reason, it's just outside of my capabilities, uh, I put down my hammer and I walk away. I'll let somebody else do it because I don't like failure. There is nothing in this world makes me feel worse than putting myself in a position where uh, I'm subject to being criticized. I'm subject to being condemned. I'm subject to people talking trash about me. I, I'm not going to put myself in a position to go through all that. The last 30 years of LGBT affirming ministry, that's exactly where I've lived for 30 years. And so far here in Alabama, I hadn't moved from that address yet. I've got people all over the country just praying for me to fail. People who call themselves LGBT affirming Pentecostals, mind you. Uh, they're just praying for me to fail. I can't preach a message but that they're criticizing and condemning and trying to pull apart every word I speak. I, I get feedback, folks. <sighs> Normally... I'd have walked away from this mess 28 years ago because I am not going to put myself in a position to be the butt of people's jokes, to be criticized and called names and, you know, and to feel like I feel enough like a failure all by myself. I don't need people calling me one. And I have lots and lots and lots of people out there who call me that, okay? Uh, it's not in me. It's not in me. It's not in me. I, I can't even tell you how much it is not in me to keep going through these kind of conditions and in these kind of situations. But the Spirit of the Lord literally just today, just today, helped me realize. He said, Charles, I knew I was asking you to go into an awful rough environment. I knew I was asking you to go into a very, very tough place. But what you didn't realize was I gave you the gift of faith. And it's that faith that sustains you. It's that faith. If you didn't have that faith, you would quit. You would give up. It's not about perseverance. It's not about just being tenacious, you know. No, it, it goes beyond that. Why do people persevere? Why are people tenacious? There has to be something that motivates them to persevere. There has to be something that motivates. You know, a scientist may go into the backwoods of the rainforest to uh, study some tribe somewhere. And the journey there might be treacherous, and he might go through all kinds of hell and high water to reach those people. But why does he do it? Because he wants that knowledge. He wants to know, you know, he's hungry for that knowledge. So that's what motivates him to persevere. So in, in my case, what motivates me to persevere? The Spirit of the Lord helped me to realize faith. I put faith in you. And that's what keeps you going when, uh, if it were honestly up to me, I'd have quit. I'd have quit so long ago, it's not even funny. All right? So the gift of faith is not just a matter of somebody believing God for miraculous things, believing God for big things, but the gift of faith often is imparted to individuals 
because God knows that if they are going to be able to do what he's asking them to do, it is literally going to require supernatural faith. Do you follow what I'm saying? So uh, if you've got a mountain in front of you bigger than anything and, you know, and, and you're like me, you've got faults in your life, weaknesses in your life that uh, would, would normally have you just saying, nope, can't do that. I'm not going to, I can't do that. Uh, then a lot, and and this can be true. Like I said, this can be true of people with marital trouble. There are people who have marital trouble, and because of past experiences, because of things in their life, they just can't get through it. And uh, so, what happens is this is an example where it might do us well to say, Lord. You need to endow me. You need to literally give me the gift of faith so that I can believe you to get through this or I can believe you to conquer this or I can believe you for the miracle I need or for the deliverance that I need. So a lot of times we pray and ask God, this is where I'm talking about faith is the currency, right? That everything that comes from heaven comes through faith. And this is why I say a lot of people pray for a healing when first they ought to be praying for faith. A lot of people pray for deliverance when first they ought to be praying for faith. When I pray for people uh, who are sick, when I pray for people who are struggling, I literally pray, Lord, help them to find the faith to grab hold of you, to touch the hem of your garment, to receive what they have need of. Why do I pray that? Because I can pray for their healing. I can pray for their deliverance. I can pray for their situation. But in the end, faith is the currency. So somewhere along the line, faith has to come into the equation. If the enemy has convinced you you're too bad, then you'll never get it. If the enemy has convinced you God won't do it for you, then you'll never get it. Uh, I've preached on this in the past. One of the most important lessons that uh, anyone can learn concerning faith is read in the word of God when people would come to Jesus and say, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. You can heal me. Lord, I know you're able, but I'm not certain you're willing, if you're willing. And every single time, Somebody came to the Lord, and they had the faith that he was capable, but they lacked the faith to believe for certain that he was willing. He would answer them, I will be thou made whole. Hallelujah. Praise God. What does that mean for you and I? I'm going to tell you what it means. It means when you're praying and you're saying, Lord, you know, if you would, I, I, you know, and you need to understand God's in heaven saying, I will. I will. The enemy a lot of times defeats us in the areas of miracles. The enemy defeats us in the area of healing. The enemy defeats us in the area of uh, deliverance. Not because we don't believe God is able, but because the enemy convinces us for whatever reason that God won't. Well, you cussed last week, so the Lord's not good. You know what I'm saying? You failed the Lord. You, you don't act right. You don't do right. And he'll use this condemnation and guilt to prevent you from receiving what God has for you. But God can only operate through the currency of faith. So what you're doing is your, your lack of faith concerning his willingness is nullifying your 
presence of faith concerning his ability. Do you follow? This is why it is so important. Boy, this is good. Holy mackerel. I wish I'd have had this when I was young. This is why it's so important for believers to understand the concept. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. If you're trying to walk with God, if you're trying to live for the Lord, I don't care how much you slip. I don't care how much you fall. I don't care how many times you fall flat on your face. There is therefore now no condemnation. If you get that through your head, you cut the enemy off at the pass because he'll use condemnation and guilt to prevent you from being able to receive from the Lord. He'll use that condemnation and guilt every time. Not to convince you that God isn't able, but to convince you that he's not willing. Well, why would the Lord do that for me? Look at the failure that I am. Look at how often I fail him. Look at how terrible I do trying to live for him. Yeah, but you're trying to live for him. Trying to live for him means you're walking after the spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that means there is therefore now no condemnation. Hallelujah. And you get that spiritual principle in your head and honey, then your faith is going to be able to carry you to higher heights than you've ever been in your life. But you got to get that in your head. There are a lot of people... Uh, the, the 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 Holy Ghost is quickening in this in me right now, so somebody needs to hear what I'm just about to say. There are a lot of people who have gone through things in their past that is so difficult for them to face that they bury it, that they literally they they literally will not even cognitively, consciously remember or think about this experience they had in their past. It can be child molestation, it can be um, incest, it can be all kinds of things like this. And let me tell you, the enemy uses that. He uses the guilt. People who are molested, people who experience incest, people who are raped, People who have gone through certain experiences in their life uh, of this nature, psychologically, it is human nature to assume blame. You wind up owning the blame for that experience. And whether you cognitively think about it, whether or not you really put any thought into remembering the experience itself, guess what? That blame and that guilt and that condemnation will be in your spirit even if you never, ever, ever think or remember the event. It becomes part of you. And the enemy will make sure he digs it up and stirs it up. And there are people that I know who have been seeking God for deliverance in their life from certain things. And I've tried to communicate with them, and I've tried to tell them, the Holy Ghost showed me something. There's something there at the core. There is something at the core of your being that is causing you to live a life of self-doubt and kanki tandara boshatai karamoho. Whoo, glory. A life of self-doubt and condemnation and fear. And honey, that's why you can't get hold of your deliverance. Because the enemy has, the, the word of God talks about a strong man. You know, you go into a house and it's that house has been invaded by invaders, so to speak. And he said, you, you've got to go after the strong man. You've got to go after the strongest one. 
there first, okay? If you go after the weak ones first, while you're busy trying to deal with them, the strong man's going to destroy you. This is the spiritual principle. There are times when I'm ministering to people, deliverance, they're healing, a lot of things, and they don't understand you have to address the elephant in the room. You have to address the strong man. You have to address that issue that causes you to walk every day of your life with this underlying current of doubt and fear, self-loathing, self-condemnation. You've got to somehow come to terms. You've got to remember that. You've got to bring it out. And then once you realize, once you're able to identify the strong man, once you're able to identify, I know what it is that brought all this foolishness into my life. And this foolishness has been causing me grief every minute of every day ever since it happened. Then, my friend, you're able to pray effectively. Now you're able to believe God effectively because now you know i got to address this first. You can stand there and ask God for deliverance all you want to, but first you need to get rid of the guilt and the condemnation and the self-loathing and the fear. You've got to deal with that. If you don't deal with that, you're never going to have access to the faith you need to receive the deliverance. Do you follow what I'm saying? All right. So faith uh, is a gift. Now, I was talking about Sister Chambers as well, a gift. Um, I was talking about Sister Chambers a little while ago, and, and you might wonder, you know, well, where did faith come in in the story I was telling? Well, I was trying to lay a little bit of a, of a, of a history, a little background on you concerning this lady and the kind of walk with God that she had. She was married to an unsaved man for almost 50 years by the time he died. Uh, when I knew her, she was in her 80s. And she had been married to this man for almost 50 years when he died. He was an unbeliever. He cursed God. He was miserable. Three different times he tried to kill her. She woke up one time with him trying to put a pillow over her head and kill her. One time he came out of the house and held a shotgun up and was aiming at her to shoot her. <coughs> she said, I rebuke you, Satan, in Jesus' name. And she said, all of a sudden he broke out crying and dropped the gun. And I can't remember what the third one was that she told me, but three different times he tried to go. This man was full of devils. He was, he, he was just, and she didn't divorce him either. She didn't leave him either. She said, I kept praying for him. I kept praying for him. God save him. God save him. God save him. Said, finally, the very end of his life, she said he was sick. And we knew he didn't have long. She said, I kept praying and saying, Lord, he, he's not long for this world. You need to save him, Lord. You need to save him. Talk about faith. After everything she'd been through with him, she's still praying for him. She's still believing God for him. She said all of a sudden she heard him cry out from the bedroom, Veneer, that was her first name. She ran to the bedroom. She walked in the door. She said, he looked at me, and he lifted his hands like this. And she said, and all of a sudden, he began to speak with other tongues. She said, God filled him with the Holy Ghost. He must have repented right there on his bed. She said, and he lifted his hands and began to speak with other tongues. God filled him with the Holy Ghost. And she said, minutes later, he was dead. How many of us could go through a marriage like that? How many people would have divorced that man, you know, after 10 years of going through garbage, right? But she had the gift of faith. And that gift of faith, and, and listen, I, I'm not condemning anybody that can't 
do what she did because that's what I'm trying to help you understand. She did it because she was endowed with the gift of faith. Do you follow what I'm trying to tell you? Not everybody has the gift of faith. It is a gift. Not everybody has that. But for whatever reason, God chose to impart unto her the gift of faith, partly because I think there were so many tasks that he was going, and again, if you ever, I share a lot of her stories over the years, you'll hear me share more, but um, there were so many things that were going to come at her in her life that she was going to need supernatural faith for, you know, and so God endowed that woman with faith like nobody's business, and uh, and that's what he does, and this is something that a lot of us uh, who are struggling with things, we need to understand that uh, if we don't have it, he is able to give it. Amen. And the Bible talks about desiring the gifts. And there's nothing wrong with desiring gifts. There's nothing wrong. And faith is one of the wonderful things about the gift of faith is it, it's not a self-serving gift, so to speak, you know. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with any believer praying and asking God for faith, you know. Lord, give me the gift of faith. Um, the only thing is, if he gives you the gift of faith, don't be surprised if you wind up having to walk down some awful rocky roads. Because the gift of faith isn't there for you to walk on carpet and satin, you know, your whole life. No, the gift of faith is there so that you're able to navigate some extremely difficult pathways, okay? Now, let's try to move forward a little bit now while I've got a little less than half an hour. The gifts of healing. Healing manifests itself through believers in a couple of different ways. There, there's different ways. And this is why I believe the Lord uses, uh, Paul uses in 1 Corinthians, um, the plural, the gifts of healing, rather than the gift of healing. Because healing and the gift uh, of healing can manifest itself in a number of different ways. For instance, as an example, uh, there are those who can pray someone through to a healing. And then there are those who can simply lay hands on the sick and they recover. If you remember, for instance, uh, in the, in the uh, book of Acts, the Bible said there was a lame man who was laying by the gate of the temple that's called Beautiful. And uh, Peter and John were going into the temple and the lame man was begging alms, you know, begging for someone to give something. And Peter and John said, hey, look on us. And the Bible said he looked on them. He looked at them expecting to receive something from them. And they said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. <laughs>
Not everyone is endowed with that gift. Now listen, this is an important principle to understand. Now, what are you doing with that? All these mixed up. But anyway, uh, this is something that's extremely important, excuse me, to understand. Uh, there's a reason why the Lord imparts the gifts the way he imparts the gifts there's a reason why the gifts operate as they operate and that reason is simply this we are the body of christ as the church collectively we represent jesus christ in the earth collectively we represent the lord when believers, um, when we come to the house of God, when we fellowship with one another, when we worship with one another, when we engage in corporate activity, the word of God said in the book of Acts, after the day of Pentecost, it said, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the breaking of bread, in prayers. In, and in fellowship and in prayers. So when we engage in corporate activities as the church of God, what happens is we are bringing together all the different individuals, each of them having their own unique gifts, their own unique abilities, which are God given. And we together are able to experience everything that God has for us. Everything. You can't do it alone. You're a fool if you think you can. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have loved one to another. The word of God tells us, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as is the custom of some, even the more as you see the day approaching. Let me tell you, God designed this thing so that we would understand we need each other. We need the church. We do not necessarily need a church house. A, a church building. The building is not the church. The people are the church. But we need each other. You need to be part of a church. You need to be part of a fellowship. You need to be part of a body. That is the only way, the only way you're going to get access to the fullness of the blessing of the That's the only way you're going to have access to uh, the gifts, all the gifts of the Spirit. That's the only way you're going to be able to receive the word of knowledge when you need a word of knowledge, to receive a word of wisdom. When you need the word of wisdom, that's the only way you're going to be able to hear the prophecy. That's the only way you're going to be able to hear tongues with interpretation. That is the only way often that you're going to be able to receive the miracle that you need because somebody in the church has the gift of faith and somebody in the church has the gift of healing and they're able to touch the Lord for you. And to run around thinking that as a believer, you can live this thing solitary. I'm going to news for you, honey. That is a satanic deception from the hell, and it is destroying the church, and it is destroying millions of people because it is wrong. Right. 
not seeing me on the camera cannot do for you what the incredible Holy Ghost and empowered fire baptized worshiping church with the gifts of the Spirit and our inspiration. It's not the same. You you cannot get from a TV preacher. You cannot get from an internet uh, sermon or an internet teaching. You cannot experience these things. No, you have to be part of the body. We've talked about it in the past. You know, the Riverside Church in London that I was part of many years ago was one of the most wonderful Holy Ghost churches that I've ever been part of in my life. And I thank God I was able to be part of it when I began my pastoral ministry. The Lord blessed so that every church I've ever pastored I was in the same vein as Riverside. And I never, I, when I was a kid, I didn't even know what a church like Riverside looked like exactly. And I never experienced anything quite like a church. I grew up in a great church. And the gifts, the gifts of the Spirit were in operation and all that. We didn't worship like they did at Riverside. And, and there were certain uh, things that I feel like at Riverside um, were manifested, you know, more regularly and powerfully. Uh, I'm going to tell the story real quick before we run out of time. There was one service at Riverside when a lady from the church was singing a special. And uh, I love this lady. For some reason, this woman always had, she just held a special place in the heart. I used to love her to death, and, and there was just something about her that, that always pulled at my heartstrings. She was an older woman. She was uh, not as old as the brother and sister Gillum, but she was the next generation below, and uh, so, but she was quite a bit older than me, you know, probably close to 30 years older than me. We just loved her and admired her and put the world in her. She played organ. She was a very stoic lady. Um, she wasn't a shouter, you might say. You know, she wasn't much of a shouter, even a dancer and that sort of thing. She was a very stoic kind of a lady, but but a sweet, precious woman, and I loved her. Well, this one service, she was up in front of the church on the microphone, on the platform, singing especially. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, look up to her right now when we lay hands on her. Now you at Riverside. At Riverside, there is perfectly nobody really would believe anything. If the Lord lays on your hand to do something, you do it. And let me tell you, in, in any church, you can understand that's how it works too. Because when God speaks, I mean, you need to obey the Lord. He knows what he's doing. Well, I was 16 years old. He was new to the church. He hadn't been there very long. And I was terrified. I said, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. I, I was trying to lose strength the courage, but I couldn't. Finally, I said, Lord, I can't do it. I can't, I can't lose strength the courage. I said, please tell somebody else to do it. Tell me, God ain't real. I swear to God. And I said, Lord, tell somebody else to do it. If five seconds pass, I'd be surprised. All of a sudden, Brother Gillum stood and he always, when people see the spiritual, he always would sit on the inside side of the church at the very front pew and, and sit there while people sang specials and stuff. And he got up, he walked up on the platform, he laid his hand on her head, and boy, she fell on the floor like a tune of bricks. All of a sudden, the Holy Ghost fell in that church. Holy mackerel. The Spirit of the Lord fell was like electricity touching everyone, and folk began to shake and get him. We started him to church all over the place. And she laying there on the platform. A couple Sundays passed. And during testimony, she got up and she said, 
a couple of weeks ago, she said, you know, Brother Gillum got up and come up and laid hands on me while I was singing. All he said, he didn't pray for her, he just laid hands on her, said, in the name of Jesus, that's all he said. She said, what he didn't know, and my parents didn't know, and nobody in the church knew, because I didn't want to tell anybody that. I had been diagnosed with breast cancer, and the doctors wanted to perform a double mastectomy. She said, my mother was healed of breast cancer way back in like the 40s. And she said, but she knows the struggle. And, the, you know, before she got her healing, she had to go through a lot of stuff. And she said, um, and I didn't want to worry her. And, you know, she said, honestly, I, I just didn't want to worry my parents. I didn't want to worry anybody. She was trying to keep it quiet. She said, I knew eventually I was going to have to tell somebody. She said, but I, I was just trying so hard to deal with it. She said, well, a couple Sundays ago, I was singing a special. And Brother Gillum got up and laid hands on me. She said, I went back to the doctors. They were doing some more tests and stuff, planning for surgery. It was gone. She said, there was nothing. They can't plan it. She said, there's not even any evidence that it's ever been in your body. The gifts of healing. He didn't pray for her. He just laid hands on her. She received her healing. Yet there are other instances where when I was pastoring my first church 40, almost 40 years ago, they honestly can tell you, and I, I know for a fact I'm being as honest as, as a judge. My ministry and our church had a reputation. If you needed healing, our church was the church to come to. We had people calling us from all over the world. We had people calling us from all over the state of Connecticut and all over New England because they needed deliverance from demons or they needed healing in their body. Our church developed a reputation. Everybody we prayed for got healed. And uh, and I mean everybody, honey. If if you came and we prayed for the Lord and you and we prayed for you, you got your healing or you got your deliverance. That, there was no question about it. When my Aunt, I have an aunt who honestly is a very rebellious and very, uh, I don't even know how to say it. She, she, she's, she just a negative, nasty woman, to be frank. And she's been that way since she was a teenager, literally. When she and I were kids, she was constantly at my throat. That girl constantly came. She was another one the enemy used to come against my calling and come against my ministry constantly. And uh, to give you an example, I'll, I'll give you an example of two different gifts operating at different times. We were at Thanksgiving dinner one day. My aunt decided that she didn't want to go to the Pentecostal church anymore because they talked too much about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And her husband needed to be saved, quote unquote. So she decided, I'm going to go to a church that spends time preaching salvation and not always preaching about this baptism of the Holy Ghost, even though she was supposed to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost since she was a kid. And so she quit going to the Pentecostal church, started going to a Baptist church. Well, we were sitting down at Thanksgiving dinner one night. Uh, it, they were doing it at her house that year. And uh, my grandmother was there, several of my aunts and uncles, different ones, and we were talking. And I told her, I said, Faith, I'm going to tell you something. The Bible said, unto whom much is given, much is required. You know better. You know way better than to go backwards. 
And to go to a church that doesn't preach the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you, God, you know better than that. Now, of course, like I said, this girl and I, she'd been at odds with me from day, so she didn't like the word of sin. And then I said to her, I said, the day is going to come when the life of one of your children is going to be hanging in the balance. And the only way you are going to be able to save your child's life is to call for a Pentecostal preacher to come. This is literally what I said, and I know that you with all and pray for you. You know why I said that. Those words come off my lips. Long story short, it was the word of knowledge. Not a prophecy. That was the word of knowledge. The Lord was telling her something through me that I had no way of knowing. This was the exact thing I spoke <laughs> When I started in my first church, I mean, I don't think it was a year later. Uh, it, I think it was within the same year, roughly. And all of a sudden, my aunt, who had had, you know, I was thinking about the end of the day. I think I misspoke when I last shared this this morning. She had already had two children. She was pregnant for her third. She had, you know, miscarried about three or four times and the doctors told her that she was no longer capable of carrying a child to term. They said you can't do it, your body cannot do it, that every time you get pregnant, you're gonna the, the it's gonna evacuate and you know. And she got pregnant again and again and it kept happening and happening. Finally one day she had been pregnant again and um, she began to miscarry, and she knew she began to miscarry. And she went to my grandmother's house so that her husband and two kids, you know, she wouldn't have to wait on them and try to take care of them. She was in a lot of pain. She was really hurting. And of course, emotionally, she was going through a very difficult time. Well, I happened to go my, my grandmother's house that day and my grandmother was standing off. Faith was on the pulling sofa bed in the in the living room. My grandparents didn't have an enormous house. And she was on the sofa bed in the living room. And my grandmother was standing in the doorway to the kitchen as somebody came in. And my grandmother motioned for me to come to her. My grandmother was grieved that Faith had left the Pentecostal church to go to this Baptist church. And uh, she called me, and I went back, and I said, what's Faye doing here? You know, why would she be sleeping all so a bit? She's got a husband and kids and everything else. She's a house and room. And Grandma said she's having a little miscarriage. She said she started miscarrying. This was like her fourth or whatever it was. And she said, CJ, I talked to her, and she agreed to have you anoint her with all and pray. And I looked at my grandmother and I said, are you sure? Are you sure she's open to this? And she wants this. And my grandmother said, honey, God is my witness. You ask her. She said she wants you to want to go and pray for her. So I went in the living room and I said, Faith, I said, um, grandma tells me that you want me to anoint you with all and pray, is that true? And my aunt said, yeah, she tells me everybody you pray for gets healed. As I told you, that's reputation. My grandmother had been healed to this woman. And uh, she said, so yeah, you know, but she was like begrudgingly, you know. And I said, well, you know what, Faith, you made one mistake. Well, Said you exercised the gun faith to ask to be in the room and go and pray for it. According to James 5, that's all you got to do. That's why it says, Is there any sick among you? Let him flow for the elders of the church. You see, by the person who's sick asking, they're exercising faith. Okay, so that's a condition. This is why I don't run around offering to anoint people who pray for them. 
will pray with people who pray for him. Mm -hmm. Do not remind me to pray for anyone unless they specifically ask me to do so. Why? Because I'm some magic worker new. Because everything God does, he does through the medium and currency of faith. By her asking to be prayed for and known and all, she was exercising a mustard seed of faith. And God himself made that a new condition to receive a miracle. Long story short, when the owner who was all prayed for, she was still cramping. She was still bleeding. She was still getting up to go to the restroom. She said, I'm still passing tissue blood. The baby is 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 evacuating. I asked her, I said, how far gone are you? I think she said three months or four months. And I said, okay, so you're supposed to have this baby, say, in five months, you know. I said, Faith, you're going to have this baby. You're going to have this baby. Well, you can't. I really started passing it. You know, you know, she knows what it looks like. And I said, Faith, you're going to have this baby. And I said, the same gun, the same gun that can form a baby brand new in your womb, can reform this baby. If there ain't but one cell left in your body, you is able to take that cell, and he's able to multiply it, he, he, and make a new baby from it. But you're going to have this, this baby, and you're going to have it when you're supposed to have this baby, so that you know it's this baby you're having, and not a new one. You from a future pregnancy. Long story short, she woke up the next morning. See, I'll tell you folks, never be so foolish as to doubt a miracle because it doesn't happen the way you expect it to happen or it doesn't happen on the time frame that you expect it to happen. If you're obeying the word of God, if you're doing what God's asked you to do, then know that God is going to answer and he's going to do. He's going to do your thing. She woke up the next morning, felt great, felt good. She wound up continuing, carried that baby to term. Went to the doctors. They said, we still detect a heartbeat. Carried that baby to term, had her third baby. Then, as if to add insult to injury, she got pregnant again, had her fourth child with complication. Then she and her husband, that she was so concerned about that she left the Pentecostal church, wound up divorcing. She married another man who was quite a bit older than she. And long story short, because I only have a few minutes, she got pregnant again in her 40s with her fifth child. And even in her 40s, she carried that baby to term without a single complication and gave birth to her fifth child. She gave birth to a miracle baby and then two fold. One in her 40s when a lot of women have complications, okay? I'm here to tell you, when God performs a miracle, I mean, God performs it well. And he performs a complete and total miracle. He didn't just allow her to have the baby she was carrying, and that was the miracle, you know. <laughs> he healed her. All of a sudden, she didn't have no problem carrying babies anymore. And she wound up giving birth to two more. That is an example of personal leaders who were in the knowledge that came to her. And I'm going to tell you a little secret. I've had that happen so many times through me. I've said things to people at very, very specific things, you know. I said, this is the one day this is going to happen. And boy, how did it happen, you know. But anyway, um, and it happened exactly, not similarly to the way I said it. I mean, word for word, written in the line, exactly the way I said it. It's the word of knowledge. But in faith's case, you saw the miracle of healing come through anointing with all in prayer. Okay. So there are gifts of healing. There's laying on of hands, and there is anointing with all 
or prayer, through prayer, I should say, through prayer, because uh, a lot of people can receive miracles with prayer to battle with, you know. Uh, but uh, I'm wanting to know what prayer is in the way that God has provided for us to receive healing. Okay. All right, folks, listen, um, in the future, we are going to be, like I said before, we're going to be going into a lot more depth about uh, some of the specific gifts, and we're going to go into how these gifts operate as it relates to worship and what have you. Uh, but the, the, the first few weeks, we're just going through the nine gifts and trying to get a pretty clear understanding of what each of these gifts are. And then from there, we're going to branch out. Are you enjoying the study so far? I hope you're getting something out of this. Let me tell you what. I told you, Mr. Reynolds, and I heard, um, when you get to feeling the Holy Ghost and you just feel the Lord, you can't help but when you start talking with the goodness of God and the realness of God and the blessings of God and miracles and, you know, answer prayer, tell you, it set you on fire. And, uh, you know, the Word of God promises, they that wait upon the Lord, they that do His bidding, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And I gotta tell you, every time I'm doing what God's called me to do without fail, He steps in and gives me wings. Hallelujah. So let's close with prayer. It's the nine o'clock in the morning. Master, we love you, God, and we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the reality of the presence and power of God in our lives and in the church today. We thank you, Lord, for the principles and the truths which we have discussed and talked about tonight. We pray, God, that every word which has been spoken would find its way past our thinking and to our very heart. Lord, today, let the people of God understand we need each other. We're the body of Christ. We must be part of the body so that we might benefit from the fullness of the gifts which are imputed not to any one individual, but minister them operate through the various members for the benefit of the whole. Master, help us, Lord, to be safe in this wicked and dangerous world in which we live until the next time we're able to come together. Oh, Lord, we love you. We thank you, God, for this event. Go with us from this place. Keep us in your care. We ask it in Jesus, Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. All right, folks, I hope we'll see you Sunday, willing. At 3 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time, do know that we have we have fixed the sound issue, okay? I apologize for last Sunday. We don't know what happened or how it happened, but we believe we get that um, fixed. So you should have real good, better sound quality than we've ever had before in any future Sunday services. And then, of course, next Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, I hope you'll join us for worship and the word. If you live in the Birmingham, Alabama area, and you're the least bit interested in a ministry like ours, being in York, the LGBT affirming, Jesus name, spirit-filled work, we need you to contact us. We are willing to start meetings down in the Birmingham area as well. And I am not going to do it until we have some of the committed to meeting with us. We're not going to spend the money and put forth the effort until we have some souls lined up that want to worship with us and, and uh, want to help us try to do something in Birmingham. So give us a call at 256-755-5725. You can send a text or you can email at Forward Christian Center, all one word, and you will come and we'll be happy to respond. And let's do something for the Lord in Birmingham as well, okay? We'll bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer. Hope to see you someday.